Maturity resilience mo model. I really look forward at looking that paper. It's a very interesting paper. I just want to know, you know, we you do summative assessments, etc. But how are you going to get the exact measures to some as do the summative assessments? Um, th thanks very much. Um, well, the uh, I'll start with a sort of answering the question a little bit backwards. Uh, the plan is to design a piece of software, um, an application um, which can crunch all the data because it's going to be a significant amount of data. And what we would have to do is to partner with a particular industry professional body um, I don't want to mention any names, uh, but to partner with an industry professional body so that this is really, uh, you know, not just you know, some academics from some university going to ask people for data because that's not going to work, right? Um, it would have to be, you know, some uh, level of recognition by an industry professional body um, that uh, people buy into um, and are interested in actually using this particular framework. Um, but the second part of that is that because of the nature of the problem being a cyber security problem and therefore you know there's a lot of issues around the sensitivity of the data even the sensitivity of data about vulnerability uh, that this is really an instrument that people would use inside their organizations by people that professionals that they employ um, to to collect the data so that the the, the issues of sensitivity are perhaps uh, more easily dealt with internally in the organization than by so-called outsiders. Yeah. I don't know what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> but she answered it. <laughs> okay, more questions or comments? Perhaps I could ask a question. There are two talks in the session uh, relating to gender. Uh, the prop and gender, uh, your student and uh, my student over there. What do you have to say to each other? I mean, is there some, is there some synergy between what you guys are doing? Uh, thanks, bro. Um, our work essentially looks at um, efficacy uh, in terms of how to measure efficacy. In, the distinctness between how women approach cybersecurity issues is what was the underlying premise. And we kind of discovered that um, women are non-committal in some of these percepts of security. And, and that was the essence of how to measure, uh, because efficacy, efficacy looks at the output of a task. And self-efficacy looks at how you're predisposed to perform that task and the confidence you have that towards output of that task. Now, there's a, some resonance between that and has regarding the obvious gender disparities regarding our perceptions, regarding security, understanding, and she touched about awareness. But we are, we are more interested in the measure, how, how, the distinctness of how efficacy can be measured and if data can confirm that distinct difference. And we did find that, we did find that there was um, some underlying differences between how, how men tackle certain uh, security uh, uh, standards, percepts, uh, conditions, uh, and pillars. Perhaps uh, she can also answer that in terms of how she found our work uh, resonating towards what she also felt. Okay, um, essentially, um, those were just high level um, findings of the whole research. So I found it that it, it does correlate to what you're saying um, with the truism theory. Is it a theory, right? Um, the truism theory, because you find that a lot of, um, when I looked at the gender, when I was doing um, literature reviews, you find that, um, in, in fact, there are underlying factors um, for females, especially, because the way that um, they're brought up in societies and the way that they're actually introduced into technology, it's most it's, it's mostly known as a male domain. So those kind of factors, and in the STEM fields, you find that there's more, even in organizations, you find that there's more um, um, 
males than females it's still a shortage so with with that being said um, a lot of females are still actually failing to actually identify um, cybercrime and males actually are the perpetrators of cybercrime because they're more um, tech savvy so for me I think that's how um, it correlated and I think it, has, it can open a platform for collaboration because uh, underlying that is the, now the next step what happens after understanding that sort of difference how is that difference now managed and perhaps that's where there's opportunity to kind of understand and, and, and we feel that the work has synergy between what the fi our findings and what our findings are I can well understand that the men may think that they are more aware of what's going on and so on, but do you have any evidence for whether a man is more likely to fall for a phishing email, particularly if he's got pictures of Jennifer Aniston at the end of it, um, or females? I mean, is the social engineering resistance the same as the perception of their skill? Yeah, I get, uh, in terms of, and, and this is where transdisciplinary research comes in, in terms of social psychology, how people, how men definitely behave with um, certain sets of information and how men process certain information that's distinctly different from how women process the same sets of information. And we provided a skill set of 10 itemized uh, security tenants, and we wanted to see how men, with the same tenants, how men are. And, and to answer that, women are more cautious of, of the actions that they take as opposed to men who kind of jump in and they are ready to give an answer, uh, underlying the idea that they know it, whereas uh, we, we actually did realize that women are more cautious. So taking, for instance, hypothetically the same scenario, a uh, man would be more likely to jump into that, whereas a woman would tend to be more cautious uh, given the underlying environment so there's that distinct difference. Yes, I also find that in as much as males are aware, they're actually not that um, what, risk averse. They're actually much more of risk takers than the females. You find that also in my study that females actually did answer to some of the questions as neutral because they're actually you know afraid to go out there and be like, okay, this this is what I do or. Perhaps that's how they are on, on, on the online domain, that they're actually more conservative than males. Yeah, I, and also, I, so one of, one of the conditions is it's, the context has also has been social cultural. And given the context of Africa and, and the, altru, uh, the truism aspects that prevail in the minds of women and in the minds of where they, they should be, Definitely, we saw that as contributing to the data that was coming out, as opposed to, say, a Western perception of the same ideals. Okay, I, my comment no. uh, for the Prof, Prof uh, Michael and Prof Lucy. Now, when you look at your models, you measure measuring resilience, you measuring capability or capacity broadly would you say there's any there could be some some relationship between between the two because I am really seeing very very good uh, frameworks here which could um, which have potential to to um, you know, to assist in measuring, I mean, this is more on, on, especially on the social side, because it's difficult to measure some of the, um, the social aspects. Yes, uh, the, the framework for the resilience is much more aimed as an organization, I think, than as a nation. So we're complementary in that respect. And I, I have philosophical doubts about trying to boil everything down to a number because why are you giving the various resilience bottom level things the same weight and the, 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 you know, you're sort of adding up apples, pears and a few bananas as well uh, and coming out with a number uh, we, we have taken the conscious decision to leave the separate dimensions separate and indeed you can see on the spider graphs with the various factors are individually 
Uh, and so, uh, I don't know if you've got any response to that. Uh, I, I think a very interesting question, um, why measure? Uh, and I think the, the, the simple answer is that it's got to do with organizational behavior. Uh, is there a way of encouraging organizations to look a little bit more deeply at their reality? Because organizations have so much that they have to deal with, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, there's some sort of massive a vibration of uh, hundreds of thousands of activities taking place. It's very easy to get distracted. Um, so this is really, I suppose, a mechanism to say, hold on, actually understand where you're positioned. It's not an exact science. We're using math to kind of um, create an understanding uh, rather than a highly uh, specific measure because there isn't such a thing. I mean, we, we, we're not thinking of maths as accurate in that sense. But then to say, oh my gosh, I thought I'm, if you'd asked me, I would have said I'm in quadrant three and I'm in quadrant two or shock horror, I'm in quadrant one. So it's more a question of, you know, ultimately organizational behavior change and change management and putting resources in the hands of uh, leaders and professionals in those organizations who often struggle to get behavioral change. I mean, you may be the CIO or the CISO. That doesn't mean everybody's going to change their behavior because you say they should. So I think that's the sort of simple answer to the question. Yeah. yeah but why add th everything up? Why not have a nice uh, little graph of wiggly things yeah. with occasional spikes in it where they're doing well, yeah. whereas you, you have sort of flattened that all out. Yeah. Well, I, I, th I think you're right, and I think one can do that, those two things simultaneously, uh, because you now have so much data that you can generate all forms of visualization. So the CRQ is one particular form of visualization, and it will possibly give rise to the opportunity to create a multiplicity of visualizations. Thank you. Thank you. What, what didn't come out um, is the, pri the privacy part, and I have I had something for Emila. I think she, she's she's left, but but perhaps we could we could comment. Some of some of you can comment. It's about, you know, um, she talked about communities setting the community standards, you know, herself in, in, in Facebook. And yesterday I was listening to a commentary. The people were fierce on, on one of the radio stations. Um, and they were, they were asking whether it is proper to, to post, you know, some, uh, um, the, the dead body of a relative and and um, people were really angry because they thought somebody has crossed the line you know why would you if you haven't posted a, a, a picture of a, a relative while he's still alive and then and then there you go and you post it after the person has, has died what are, what are you communicating? Is it, you know, are you not crossing, are you not, have you not crossed the line? And there were one or two that said, maybe you haven't crossed the line, but the majority of the people were saying you have actually crossed the line. And so if I look at what she showed here about the culture and the setting of standards, I thought that's something worthy of commenting on. Maybe, yeah. And there is certainly uh, something about whether there is a particular cultural standard in this part of the world which is different from elsewhere, and they probably ought to respect that. But the thing that she carefully ducked away from is the reasonableness of monetizing people in general. I mean, the entire business model of Facebook is that you are their product and they sell you. I, I think an interesting point made by Prof. Larson here, when she finished, she says it's 1%, the job is 1% done. But she, they have 100% of your data already. Yeah. So it's scary that 99% has missing. Uh, you know, in terms of 
privacy issues and protection. But I think we should. Okay, do you want to say a few closing comments? Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe we must give them a round of applause. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for, for the guys who lasted the entire day, well done. Uh, but uh, tomorrow is uh, another full day. Uh, I know that the minister's office has sent out a press release indicating that she'll be here tomorrow to, to address the conference in the morning. So uh, hopefully she still turns up. We, we never know. But the press release is a positive sign. Okay, so that uh, she'll be here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, sometime between 8 and 9, she'll, she'll do her address. I'm followed by the normal program, of course. So uh, we have a cocktail party this evening. Please mix and um, network and things and, uh, and enjoy some drinks and some snacks later on with us. And I've got some uh, Pitts University jazz band students uh, to come and entertain us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.